Well, hey, community, how are you guys today? <laughs> Hope you're doing well. So good to see you. It's good to be back. I want to welcome those of you that are in the room. I want to welcome those of you that are online right now that are joining us. And you know the drill. Let's give a shout out to our campus at Pompano Beach. We love you guys. Glad you're joining us today, being a part of this. Well, Lori and I were out last Sunday. I think many of you are aware that on Monday, July the 25th, Lori's mom passed away. She was 88 years old. She lived an incredibly full life. We, last Sunday in St. Petersburg, we had a memorial service for her. And uh, four pastors spoke, all from our family. I mean, Sue Ann has this incredible spiritual legacy. It was phenomenal. And it was a time of joy, it was a time of celebration and, and some tears. And so I just wanna thank you for your prayers, for Lori, for me, for our family, and uh, for your cards. Many of you have sent cards. Thank you guys so very much for that. We, we appreciate it very much. Well, yesterday was the start of something very important. Last night, as a matter of fact, it was the beginning of the Miami Dolphins undefeated season. <clears throat> Undefeated, baby. It's, it's preseason, but it counts unless they lose. And then it doesn't count if they lose, but they won. I watched the game. So uh, it's football season again, and it just feels good. I'll be honest with you. It just feels good. Well, today what I want to do is I want to talk to you today about replenishing your life, restoring your soul. Have you ever felt like your soul needs to be restored? <laughs> there have been some seasons where I feel like that needs to happen for me, that's for sure. If you feel overloaded right now, you're not crazy. If you feel overwhelmed, I get that. The average office worker gets 220 messages a day from emails to phone calls to text messages to interruptions. That's the average is 220. Many of us, we're above average, so we can certainly feel overloaded. I, I get that. I read this week about Andrew, age five, and I mean, I've got some grandkids, and I think it's incredible their skills when it comes to uh, technology. Andrew was really into technology and computers and everything, and he was actually, he had learned the, uh, the Lord's Prayer, and he did really pretty well until he got to the end, and then at the end, he said, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from email. <laughs> Anybody want to be delivered from email? I do. I mean, if, if when I die, I see a computer, I'll know that I didn't make it. You know, I mean, I'll, I'll just be honest with you. I, that's, uh, I'll love to be delivered from email. There's a photographer that was snapping some photos of first graders in elementary school at the beginning of year, taking the school pictures as often is going to happen pretty in just a few weeks. And he was making some small talk to put the kids at ease. There's a little girl that was there, and, uh, and he asked, he said, what are you going to be when you grow up? And she just sighed and said, tired, <laughs> tired. I think she's mirroring something from mom and dad there on that one. I don't think that's what Jesus had in mind when he gave us his purpose statement. I, I, I don't think I've given a message in a while that I haven't quoted Jesus in John chapter 10, verse 10. So we're going to read this out loud. You should have it memorized. I want you to know why Jesus came. He said why he came. Let's read this together. I have come in order that you might have life, life in all its fullness. And the truth is, a lot of us aren't experiencing the fullness of life. We're, well, we're on empty, and we need a soul that needs to be restored. There's two paddle boats. It's back in the day, they were on the Mississippi River. They're around Memphis, and they're going north on the Mississippi River. And a lot of those captains, they knew each other. And these two paddle boats, they happened to become, you know, right side by side. And the two captains were kind of looking at each other, and they, they started having a race. It was a little friendly race. It's kind of one to go ahead, and then the other. And then, it, well, the competition got a little serious. I mean, they had enough coal for a trip, but they didn't have enough coal for a race. And one of the captains, he really, really wanted to win. So what they did is, after they ran out of coal, they started throwing in their cargo. They started throwing in suitcases and all the cargo that they brought. And they won, but they burned up all of their cargo in the process. It's a pretty good metaphor for a lot of us. I mean, it might be that you're winning. It might be that you're winning in your career. It might be that you're winning in your profession. You may be number one in your field but you're burning up a lot of precious cargo along the way. 
I think that there are some kids that are in this room right now, maybe some spouses that are in this room right now that have kind of picked up on the direction of the message and they're just saying, God, please, please, please help my dad, help my mom to listen to this. There's some spouses that are in this room that are saying, please, God, help my wife, help my husband to listen to this message today because they're just burning up a lot of precious cargo along the way. I really don't think, you know, most of us probably have a good idea of how much is hanging in the balance in today's message. So what I want to get started today with a principle, a principle that is going to shock some of you, some of you who belong to the thank God it's Monday crowd. I mean, those of you who, I mean, you love your job and, and I love my job. And so I get that. I mean, you would hold up a sign, we'll work for the fun of it. I mean, you just will work just for the fun of it. Well, here's an important spiritual principle that's coming up in just a moment. I had a friend, uh, he's one of the funniest guys I've ever known. And when people would ask him, uh, he was on staff at a church in Clearwater that I was the youth guy at. This was a long time ago. And people would ask him, how long have you been working here? And he would always go, ever since they threatened to fire me. <laughs> That's how long he'd been working there. Somebody asked a uh, business owner one time, he said, how many people do you have working for you? And he said, uh, probably about half of them. I mean, these are people that could not identify with the thank God it's Monday crowd. Here's the principle for all those TGIMers that are out there. There is more to life than labor. There is. And, and you know, God's our example in this. And the Bible says that in Ephesians chapter 5.1, I'm going to have you read more verses than normal, but I'm, I'm giving you some short ones. Like this one's a really easy one. So he, Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1, let's read this. It says what? Follow God's example. God has actually modeled for us how we are to live a balanced life. So notice what God did. God created the world in Genesis chapter two, verse two. It says, on the seventh day, having finished his task, God rested from all his work and God, he blessed the seventh day and he declared it holy because it was the day when he rested from his work of creation. Now, during the week of creation, God has worked. He separated the land from the water. He separated the light from the darkness. He separated the earth from the heavens and then he created the fish and he created the birds and the animals. And then on the sixth day, that's when creation peaked. And that's when he, he created Adam, Adam and Eve, the first two human beings. And he created them and us in his image. But God was not done creating. That was the sixth day. After six days of work, God created one more thing. He created the Sabbath, a sacred day, a holy day, a, a day of rest. And I, I don't know, maybe God's been, you know, really busy, worked really hard so that at the end of this week, he said, thank me it's Friday or something. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what he, you know, I, I don't know. But God wanted us to know that there's more to life than just labor. There is, there's a rhythm to our existence. There's work and then there's rest. There's activity and then there's reflection there's production, and then there should be gratitude. God says, I want you to remember that you're an eternal being. Not an eternal doing, but eternal being. And I've created you, and there's more to your life than what you can cram into between now and the grave. You are destined for eternity. And so you are to take one day a week where you are replenished physically, where you are renewed mentally, and you are restored spiritually. If you don't replenish your soul, well, you're just gonna burn out. Three boys were boasting about their fathers, and the, the first boy said, my dad is so fast that he can shoot an arrow at the target, and he can get there before the arrow does. Second boy said, my dad's faster than that. He can shoot a rifle at a deer at 200 yards and he can get there before the deer falls. The third boy said, my dad's faster than that. <laughs> he works every day until four o'clock, but he gets home by 3.30. I mean, <laughs> that, that's a little bit too fast there. <laughs> Seriously, this day of rest is hard for many people. It's hard for us to practice. And <laughs> I understand this because this is like a personal challenge for me, life balance. I've had my own struggles with workaholism in my life. I love what I do. 
And we have the idea that it's more honorable and being a workaholic and working seven days a week. And we rationalize that because the Bible does say in Colossians 3, 23, whatever you do, work at it, work at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord and, and not for men. So we justify, we rationalize that and we exaggerate it to the point that we don't even know how to relax anymore. We don't know that there's a time not to work. Several years ago, I bought a book by Tim Hansel. When I relax, I feel guilty. Now, I've not had time to read that yet, but I hope to get to it at some point along the way. <laughs> but the truth is, that book describes many of us. We work hard all the time. And even when we unplug, we don't unplug. I mean, we're checking email, we're checking text, we're calling back voicemails. I mean, we're working while we're supposed to be unplugging and relaxing. And it is not the same. It seems like we're always just in a hurry and we suffer from hurry sickness. One comedian said the single most frustrating aspect of driving is that you spend your entire life stopping at red lights. And he says, then at the end of your life, there's this very cruel irony. He says, when you die, they let your funeral procession run through all the red lights on the way to the cemetery. <laughs> because when you're dead, it's important that you make good time, he said. <laughs> I'm dead, but I'm early. I'm early, so... Now, God says six days a week you run. Six days a week you labor and you work by the sweat of your brow. But on the seventh day, you are to rest. On the seventh day, you remember who you are. On the seventh day, you, you remember what matters. You remember on the seventh day why you are here. On the seventh day, you remember that you are an eternal being. You remember that God loves you. On the seventh day, you remember that you matter to God. On the seventh day, you, you remember, you're reminded that no matter what you're going through, he is with you, he is for you. On the seventh day, you're reminded of this again and again. And you're reminded there's more to your life than just labor. Now, I know the thought of resting sounds unproductive to some of us. And thought of resting sounds like maybe a big time waster. <laughs> Thomas Edison, I was reading and studying this week. It wasn't in my notes, but just kind of coming out of the overflow. Thomas Edison said that sleep was an incredible waste of time. And he made sure that the people that worked for him would sleep as little as possible. And he was a great inventor, but not very wise when it came to ultimate productivity, really. Many of us haven't understood the second important principle from God's word. There's more to leisure than just lying around. There's way more to leisure than just lying around. If your idea of leisure is that it only involves lying around on the couch and binge watching some TV show and then binge watching another one that's similar to that, and just going through Netflix or, Prime, Netflix or Prime, then you have a misconception, especially of what the Bible says about this. They had a lot of misconceptions in Jesus' day about what the Sabbath Meant. They turned the Sabbath into a burden. It was never meant to be a burden. It, it became this, this whole series of, of legalistic rules of do's and don'ts. And there was actually one rabbi who taught that he would not eat an egg that had been laid by a hen on the Sabbath day. I'm not making this up now, okay? It's actually there. <clears throat> I don't know. I've never raised chickens. So I don't know that this is true or not, but it would seem to me that if you were a hen that needed to lay an egg, that it would actually mean more work to try to hold that egg in for another day to be you know, laid on the next day than it would be to go ahead and have that egg and lay that egg on that day. I, I don't know, I'm just guessing on this. Jesus comes along and there's these, these kinds of crazy things that are taking place and he, and he just said, this is all crazy talk. That's a paraphrase. Mark 2, 27, he said, the Sabbath was made to benefit people and not people to benefit the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made to be a gift to people. And the New Testament teaches us that it's really not all of that important about which day is the Sabbath. Paul was quite clear in Romans 14 that no one day is more sacred than another. In the early church, they, they worshiped not on the Sabbath day, which is Saturday. They worshiped on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, in honor of and in celebration of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead when he conquered death on that first day of the week. Matthew 28, verse one, it says, after the Sabbath, which was Saturday, at dawn on the first day of the week, on, on Sunday, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. 
But the day has never been all that important. It's the event that is celebrated. Every day is the Lord's day. Every day is the Lord's day. It just is. And and so the Sabbath is not all about all these rules. And it's not about all these do's and don'ts. And I know that some of you have work schedules where you have to work on Sundays. Some of you are watching online right now because of a work schedule that you have. Some of you, you will go to work later on in the day. I get that. Sunday is a work day for me. It's a big day. It's my most stressful day of the week, and it's a work day. Now, I've been the pastor at Community for over 28 years, and when I came to Community 28 and a half years ago, I asked the elders if I could have Sundays off. <laughs> it was the Sabbath. Incredibly gracious leaders, but they, they said, well, that's taken a little bit too far, Scott, so they, they, they nixed that. Now, the Sabbath principle is not about a particular day. It's, it's the idea of putting a Sabbath day in your life, a rhythm, a weekly rhythm. And your Sabbath day, it, it may be Wednesday. Your Sabbath day may be Saturday. It may be today. It may be Sunday. It may be Monday. My, my Sabbath day is Monday. It's a day that I protect. I don't have meetings or phone calls or anything on, on Mondays. And, this is, this is hilarious to me, probably not going to be to anybody else, but I love when, when I'm in the middle of a message and God gives me a test. <laughs> it happened on Friday. I was on this page. I was looking over this and I got a voicemail from the executive assistant of a president of a Christian university that I've never met. And, and I know him. We have a lot of mutual friends. And, I, and she asked if, if I could meet with him and he's going to be in the area. And could he meet on Monday at four o'clock? And I'm going, ha, 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 ha. So you're giving me this Sabbath test, aren't you, God? And so I just kind of laughed. I said, look, I, it might sound like I'm just, you know, whatever, but I, I don't do any meetings on Mondays. I mean, it's the day for me to be with my wife and it's project day or beach day or whatever it is, but it's not church day. And I, I don't have meetings. I, we don't have elders meetings. And I'm used to it. I said, no, nope, I'm not going to do that. I don't take phone calls. I don't say, so, look, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to blow you off or anything like this. I'd like to meet with them. And if he wants to do a Zoom call or a phone call another time, or if he can meet another day, I will, but I just can't do it on Monday. She said, okay. About an hour later, she calls back and she said, he can do this on Saturday around 5 p.m., and I said, you do know that Saturday is actually the Sabbath day. No, I didn't say that. I go, yeah, that's good. <laughs> I go, okay, I'd lose a lot of credibility on that one. I said, okay, that'll, that'll work. So I'm going to meet with him. But I just thought it was hilarious because whenever I teach on a topic, it seems like God, he just puts something in me. I, I, I don't like teaching on patience because whenever I teach on patience, it's like stuff goes wrong everywhere. And I just kind of watch and go, okay, I get it. So anyway... I understand the struggle about protecting a Sabbath. What's the benefit for us if we follow the Sabbath principle? Well, there's more to leisure than just lying around. I want to tell you that. And there are four things that I want to suggest to you. If you want to be a Sabbath keeper, if you want to lead a sustainable life, if you want to restore your soul, first of all, you will need a rest that restores, a rest that restores. The Bible says on the seventh day, God rested from his work. He quit working. He set the example for us and he rested. See, there are consequences for not stopping your work, for not resting. Our creator knew that we could not continue to operate on all cylinders, full throttle, without taking breaks. It would just break us. Exodus 23 verse 12 says you should work six days a week, but on the seventh day, you must rest all kinds of illustrations I could share, but I love this one. It was in 1850, the Hugh Harrison family was lured by the great gold rush and they decided to go to California by wagon train. And the Harrison family, deeply spiritual people, Methodist people, and they determined that every seventh day, the Sabbath, they were just gonna stop and they were gonna rest and they were gonna worship. They were gonna give their animals a break and they were just gonna, they were gonna incorporate the Sabbath into their life. And there were other people on the wagon train that were not committed to keeping the Sabbath. And whenever they would stop, they would just kind of go by them and they would yell out, pious fools. <laughs> there's gold on the streets in heaven, but there's not going to be any for you in California because we're going to beat you to it. And they would just 
honor the Sabbath. And wouldn't you know that the Hughes Harrison family, they end up, because they were, they were resting, they were able to pass all the other wagon trains and they arrived first in California and their animals were a lot healthier. God knew what he was doing. Production analysts, they, they say that a work week of about 40 hours, maybe 45 hours max is about really what a person can do. It's the optimum number of hours that a person should work and after that, you can begin to see the beginnings of breakdown and start to appear, concentration levels drop, most people's work becomes counterproductive at that, mistakes happen, morale takes a nosedive. Simple principle, my best <laughs> requires rest. And, and I, I'm, I'm a person that's very committed to rest. I, I really believe that is so true. I, I believe that, friends, maybe the most spiritual thing that you can do is take a nap. And, and I, be, I believe that, I mean, a rested person is a person that can bring their best. And I, I've been reading the last few weeks a book that I've had for a while, but I've had some extra time over the summer. It's called At Your Best, and you can see that. And I really highly recommend this book. And you can see like the red zone, the yellow zone, and the green zone. And the green zone is, your, is the time when your energy as it, is at its peak. And you can see the subtitle of that, How to Get Time, Energy, and Priorities Working in Your Favor. And it's a great book. I bought this book for both of my sons, and I've given it to other people because it's not just like about time management. It's about understanding how we are wired, and how we should work in our peak energy times with our highest priorities. And not everybody has control of that. I get that. I understand that. But if you do, it would serve you well. And this might be a good book to pick up as a resource. You focus on your highest priorities when you're in your peak energy. Doctors tell us that people ignore God's plan. They work seven days a week. Or We know that. I mean, this is not new news. They lead the charts. And heart attacks, high blood pressure. There's an old Indian proverb that says you'll break the, the bow if you keep it always bent, you just will. If your life is always full of tension and you're driving to get ahead and someday, someday, someday you will relax, God says, someday ought to be one day a week so you can replenish your life, you can renew your body so that you can restore your soul You'll break the bow if you keep it always bent. David, the psalmist in Psalm 23, the beautiful 23rd Psalm, he says, he, he lets me rest in green pastures. He leads me to calm waters. Let's read verse three together. It's four words. He restores my soul. And I like the other translation. And frankly, if I'd have, you know, I, maybe I should have had that one, but I'll just go ahead and quote it for you. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Sometimes God makes us lie down. If we're not willing to lie down on our own, he'll say, okay, okay, have it your way. You need to lie down and he makes us lie down. Why? In order to restore our soul. And when you take a day of rest, when you change your pace every seven days, you get restored to face another week. What happens? You gain perspective. I mean, the truth about me is I'm generally an up person, but I'm not immune to discouragement. I'm not immune to being in a funk. I mean, sometimes it's like you get battered again and again and again. And, and, so, and if that happens to me and I feel like I'm just kind of dragging for you know, more than an hour or a couple of days or something like that, I, the first thing I do is I go, I need to get extra sleep. It doesn't always cure that, but there's just something about rest that improves our perspective. There's something about rest that just downsizes our problems. There's something about rest that reminds us that God is God and he's the creator and he, he is the king of the universe and I just need to trust him and entrust him with whatever it is I'm going through. And Psalm 118 says this, this is the day the Lord has, has made. We'll rejoice and be glad in it. And our emotions have time to recover. We experience the presence of God. And we follow the example of Jesus. Jesus would often retreat, sometimes with his disciples, sometimes by himself, and he would renew himself. He would replenish himself. Now there's another thing that needs to be a part of your life. And that's reflection that reinvigorates. Reflection that reinvigorates. Every day as God was creating the world, remember how at the end of his day, what, he, what would he do? He would he'd take a step back and, 
in a sense. And he would look at his creation and he would say what? It is good. It is good. And then when he was finally done with all of his creation, the Bible says in Genesis 131, God looked at everything that he made and he said it was very good. Every evening passed and morning came. This was the sixth day. God reflects on his work and he savors it. And he looks back over it and he evaluates it. You see, there's something about reflection that reinvigorates us. It's a very affirming thing. God looks at all that he made and said, it's, it's, it's very good. Friends, to be like God, it means that we take some time during our season of rest and we reflect. And that reflection, hopefully, will reinvigorate us. And the psalmist said in Psalm 63, verse 6, I spend the hours in grateful reflection. I want you to know that it's, it's healthy to every once in a while to take a step back and say, you know what? That, that's good. That was good. And now, ultimately, we know that, that God gets all the glory. He's the one that's responsible for it all. But he works through us and we reflect and we say, you know, that was good. And there are times of leisure where we evaluate and we say, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty good salesperson. Or, I, I sang a pretty good song. It, it, it helped other people. I built a pretty good house. And I was a pretty good parent today. I feel good about that. Reflection reinvigorates. Now, God never makes mistakes, but we do. And so while he looks in reflection and Everything is good, we look in reflection, and not everything is good all the time. It's just not. Sometimes in reflection, we see things that need correction. We see things that need attention, that are gonna keep dragging down our lives if we don't give attention to them. This is why I think that many people choose not to slow down. That don't wanna reflect, because they're afraid of discovering once they slow down, of discovering what they already know, that there's some wounds in their life that need to be healed. There, there are some relationship damage that needs to be healed, that need to be repaired. That there are some issues that need to be dealt with. And they know that they're there. And they just don't wanna deal with that. So what many people do is they just find themselves just running faster and faster and faster and faster. The darkness is there. It's creeping up. If I start to slow down too much, the darkness is going to overcome me. So if I just keep running and keep running and keep running, the, the darkness will never catch me. And so they throw themselves more deeply into their career or they throw themselves more deeply into a hobby or maybe they even throw themselves more deeply into to church activities they never slow down long enough to reflect and, and face the truth, face the issue that really is slowing them down even though they're trying to speed up. Friends, honest reflection ought to leave us feeling affirmed about the good things that are going on in our life, but they also ought to motivate us to give attention to some areas of concern in our lives. The psalmist said in Psalm 90 verse 12, teach us to number our days. Our days are limited. We need to reflect on both the good and the not so good. If we're gonna live a life that's gonna be honoring to God and to the people around us. Another thing that needs to be a part of our lives is recreation, recreation that refreshes. All of us need some activities in our life that refresh us, that just build life back into us. You know, whether it's participating in a sport or in a hobby, or we need an activity that will just refresh us. Let me ask you kind of a puzzling question. Why do you think God rested on the seventh day? Why do you think he rested? Was God tired? <laughs> no, he's not tired. God's omnipotent. He's all powerful. He didn't rest in that sense. And I think it's safe for us to assume that there has to be a benefit that comes from resting other than just restoring sore bones and muscles and minds. Exodus 31 verse 17 says, for in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth, but he rested on the seventh day and he was what? He was refreshed, refreshed. You see, even if you're not physically tired, you need to take some time in your routine just to be refreshed. I love this verse, Psalm 104, verse three, it says of God, he makes the clouds his chariot and he rides on the wings of the wind. Those are his words describing himself. Doesn't it sound like that God just enjoys being God? 
All of us need to engage in pastimes or hobbies or crafts or games or sports more than we know. Not because the activities are so important in and of themselves. Not because we can just network and we can have business context and we can expand our, our reach or whatever that is. And, but because those activ activities remind us of how incredibly good God is and how those activities, they just breathe life into us. And recreational activities Activities remind us that, that our self-worth is not connected to our net worth or our ability to work. No, God loves us. We matter to him. Your worth is not connected to your production capability, which is how many times you can put the ball into the end zone. Friends, I, I think all of us need to figure out what recreational activities refresh us. And I think many of us know, and we're, we're leaning into that, and that's a good thing. If you're working so hard and you're not sure, you need to slow down because this is an important component of living a balanced and God-honoring life. And, and then when we've identified what they are, then we invest in them, not in a crazy way, but in a balanced way. And for some of you, it, it might be mountain biking, and I've got a lot of friends that mountain bike, and that's not it for me, you know, but, uh, but I have friends that do that, and a lot of them, and, and for others, it's jogging, and that's not it for me either. I'm going to tell you all the things that's not it for me. There's a lot of things that don't do it for me. I thought it might be golfing, and, and I've been honest about this. It was, what, 36? It's over 20 years ago now, um, when maybe 25 years ago when it was our oldest son, Chris, was like 11 years old and he was consistently beating me playing golf that I decided that God has called me to never golf again, you know? But because it, one, it was expensive. Two, it took a whole lot of time. And three, if it was just with my boys, that'd be one thing. But, and it was also embarrassing for the people that I would play with, but I'm competitive and I'm just horrible, horrible at golf. And at the end of the day, it was, it was just more depleting and frustrating. It was about that time a guy named Chuck asked me out if I wanted to go bass fishing in the Everglades. And I grew up in Jacksonville, just right off of a little tributary off the St. John's River. I grew up bass fishing when I was a kid. And I fished all the time, and, but it had been years, years, it had been decades since I'd been fishing. And I was out there, it's like something clicked inside my heart. I go, that's what I need to do. And so that be began the beginning of my fishing journey in the Everglades, which has been such an important part of my life and my boys and you find what it is for you and what it is for you. It doesn't have to be what it is for somebody else, but it needs to restore you. It needs to replenish you, not frustrate you. And maybe for you, it's restoring an old automobile. Maybe it's just getting in your car and just putting the windows down and driving. Maybe it's a deep love of music that God just uses music to restore you. Maybe you love to cook and you get together with other people who love to cook. Maybe you love to eat. And you get together with other people who love to cook. You, get, you gotta help those people. For, for me, as I've already alluded, it's being around water. I, I, Lori and I go to the beach. I love to hear the sounds of the waves crashing. I love to be at a lake. I love to be out in the glades. And I know for many of you, it's water as well. You see, the word recreation means recreate. Recreate energy. Recreate life and God breathes life into us when we do this. And it's not being narcissistic or selfish. No, it's honoring God, understanding how he has created us and wired us. And it's a component of our Sabbath rest. It's a, you see, there's a lot more to leisure than just lying around. There's a rest that restores. There's a reflection that reinvigorates. There's a recreation that refreshes us. And then lastly, remembering that recalibrates us. The whole principle of the Sabbath was so important to God that he made it one of his top 10, the 10 commandments. We read in Exodus 20, verse eight, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, by keeping it sacred. And the Sabbath day is a day to remember. God told the Israelites that they were to remember. They were to remember the times that they were stuck and they were trapped by the Egyptians as slaves and they were without hope. And what did God do? God delivered them. So remember that. Can some of you remember the time when you were stuck? Can you remember the time that you were trapped? Can you remember the time when you felt that you had no hope and then Jesus stepped into your life and he rescued you? And a Sabbath is a day to remember that. 
It's a time to remember. Ecclesiastes 12, verse, verse one, remember, remember your creator. Somebody said that our prior priorities are all out of whack today. And I mean, I, I think this is an interesting quote. I don't know how it's not true of all people. May be true of you, may not be true of you, but I thought it was an interesting one, so I included it in the message today. Leland Reichlin said this. He's an author. He's a professor at Wheaton College. He said, people today, we tend to worship our work. We work at our play, and we play at our worship. It's an indicting statement. It certainly is worth reflecting, I think. Friends, we need Sundays not just because our bodies need resting, but because, because our souls need restoring. God says, look, I, I made you. I know what is best for you. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life, life in all of its fullness. And I know how you can have the ultimate, optimal life. And so you work, you work hard six days. You give your best effort. And then on that seventh day, you have a change of pace. And more importantly, you remember me. You remember what I did for you on a bloodstained cross. You worship me. You recalibrate, you recalibrate your priorities and your values. You worship me. You, you, you're reminded why you're here. You remember who you are. You remember who I am. You remember that I am for you. You just remember, you remember. Wow. I was just having an internal debate of whether I wanted to say this or not. And I didn't expect that. But after that, I cannot not say this. I don't think we fully grasp how important it is that what we do here when we worship Jesus, when our problems are downsized, when we magnify him, how important this is to our souls and, and this is the part that I was internally debating because I have pastor friends and I watch some of their videos and sometimes they'll shame the people that are online. It's absolutely unacceptable here at community. We do not do that. We're so glad that you are with us online. We won't do that. But having said that, let me say this. If you're staying online and not coming into worship because of health concerns or where you're out of the area. We've got a lot of people that watch that don't even live here in South Florida. And you can't, you really can't be here. Then, then continue to be with us online. But I know that's not everybody. And, and there are some of you that are, it's just become easier. I get that. You don't have to get up early. You don't have to get in a shower. You don't have to get the kids fed. You don't have to get them in the car. You don't have to hassle with everything. It's five minutes before the service. You kind of roll out of bed and you turn on your phone and you watch it. And it's so much easier. And then you can go about your day. It's easier. But is it better? There's just something that happens in this room. There's something that happens in this space when collectively we are all together. Worshiping together. And, and, and we want you, if you're able, to come back and to worship with us. But we not only want you, but I believe that you need to do that for you. For you. When we come together, we remember. We remember that we have a heavenly father who reached down his hand to us to rescue us. A heavenly father who sent his one and only son to die for us. That God, that he crushed his own son so that our sins could be forgiven, so that we could have the hope of heaven one day. We matter deeply to him. You were cared for by him. And we get reminded of that again and again and again. Friends, when we remember, what does it do? It restores our soul. Jesus himself said these, these beautiful words. He says, come to me, <laughs> come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give 
you rest. Rest for your souls. And he's inviting you, he's inviting me to come to him now. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I, I thank you for this day. I, I thank you for this reminder of how you created a Sabbath, not to be a burden, but to be a gift. How you, Father, you, you created us. You know how we can function optimally and how we can have the best possible life. And we need to slow down. We need to have life breathed into us. We need to be restored. And Father, help us to take rest more seriously. Father, help us to reflect more than we do. Reflect on your goodness and the good things that we do and the things that are not so good that need to get addressed. And Father, I, I, I pray that we'll see that recreation, where we recreate energy, recreate life, it's not optional. God, if that's something that's absent from our life, through your spirit, I, I, I pray that he would take us down a path that that would become a reality for us. And Father, more than anything, we, we pray that we would rest long enough to recalibrate ourselves and we would remember your goodness. We'd remember your faithfulness. We'd remember what you've done for us through Jesus. We thank you for the model, the example that Jesus gave as he would retreat and spend time with you. Father, I, as we're gearing up for a new season, School's kicking off this week, and I, I pray that we would incorporate some life replenishing patterns if they've been non existent as we're changing into a new season, God. Father, help this to be a season of renewal, of restoration in our own lives, so that God, that we would experience what Jesus calls to the fullness, the fullness of life. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.